There is a dimension which is occupied by beings more advanced than ourselves, whom we usually don't perceive, that we're not aware of, and yet what happens in that dimension impacts what happens in this dimension. Are you interested in the cosmos? Are you interested in the nature of this dimension that we occupy? Are you intrigued by the idea of stargates or wormholes or contact with cosmic neighbors? Now, if any of those things interest you, then I'd suggest that this mysterious word from the Hebrew Bible is well worth your attention. Subscribe and turn on channel notifications by clicking the bell and selecting the All option so you never miss out on a new video. For hundreds and thousands of years, people around the world have turned to the Bible for information about God. Two scholars, Mauro Bellino and Paul Wallace argue for a radically different interpretation. Seeking out the root meanings of key words in these ancient texts, they find another, quite different story emerges. One with enormous implications for our understanding of the human race and our place in the universe. For more than two millennia, Readers have interpreted the ancient texts of the Bible as stories of God, a seamless narrative in which God creates the heavens and the earth, botanical and animal life, and eventually, the human race. However, a number of anomalies in the texts, along with intriguing questions of translation, point to another possibility. Paul Wallace is an internationally best-selling author, researcher, and scholar of ancient mythologies. Over the last decade, Paul's work has probed the world's mythologies and ancestral narratives for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. As a senior churchman, Paul served as a church doctor, a theological educator, and an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts, his work in biblical translation and interpretation has revealed a forgotten layer of ancient story, with far-reaching implications for our understanding of human origins and our place in the cosmos. Mauro Bellino is an internationally best-selling Italian author, researcher, and highly regarded scholar of ancient Hebrew. For many years, he worked for Rome's St. Paul Press as a Bible translator, providing with great precision the literal meaning of Hebrew words for Vatican-approved interlinear Bibles. It is an exacting discipline. The scholar must be rigorous in avoiding any kind of interpretation of the word and give only the literal etymological meaning of each word part. Morrow's findings set him at odds with the conventional expectations of the Catholic world and propelled him onto the international stage where his work has opened up a world of cultural memory recorded in the Bible. Yet hidden from the public for centuries by mistaken translation and the dogmas of the church. Together, Morrow and Paul show that the root meanings of a series of key words in the Bible reveal an earlier layer of information very different to the story of God associated with the Bible. Hidden plain sight in the pages of Genesis is an even more ancient narrative, one which reframes the whole story of human beginnings. Good morning. Paul and I continue with our videos about how to read the Bible in a respectful and understandable way. In the previous uh, video, Yahweh, Paul and I had pointed out that when you find in the Bible the phrase the Eternal One, it should be replaced with Yahweh. 
Because often, uh, I don't know, but uh, the reason is obviously guessable, I don't know why theologists translate Yahweh as the Eternal One, because it is a non-existent translation. It means taking a name and attributing a characteristic to it because theology has established that God must be eternal, that Yahweh must be God, and so theologists translate it that way. It's therefore an unjustified translation. We have given you this first indication and I would like to invite you to listen to the part of that video by Paul. It's very, very interesting. Now, instead, we refer directly to the term eternity, which is found in various situations. For example, Yahweh is said to be Lord of Eternity and God of Eternity. This term is always present. Now, we will see this term in an example just to understand. When we uh, find the term eternity, in Hebrew we have the word olam. Olam is then translated as eternity. But does it mean eternity? Look, there is a dictionary. This is the dictionary of Biblical Hebrew and Aramaic, in which it clearly says about the term olam, do not translate with eternity. That is, the dictionary says, do not translate with eternity. And in the Bibles, you always find it translated with eternity. But there is not only this dictionary. When I had a meeting with some theologians in March uh, 2016, one of the most important biblical scholars, perhaps the most important Italian Protestant biblical scholar, one of the authors of this dictionary, and speaking about this particular situation, he said, don't translate with eternity. And then he said, all the great dictionaries say that thing there, including theological dictionaries. That is, don't translate with eternity. But then, why is it so often translated with eternity? Because since they have established that Yahweh is God, and that therefore He is a spiritual God, and that as God He must necessarily be eternal, in some way they have to let the concept of eternity in. In that same situation, the Catholic theologian, lecturer at the Faculty of Theology of Northern Italy, said that there are no abstract concepts in the Semitic world, no metaphysical concepts, such as the concept of eternity, there is no concept of immortality, and so on. So, olam is a term that has an entirely different meaning. It simply means not known. The peculiar thing is that in most cases, olam not only does not mean eternity, but it does not even have a temporal balance. It has a special balance. That is, it indicates a place that is not known. For example, if we take the Talmud, this is one of the more than 60 tractates, the term olam, which is given here in the plural, olamim, is translated as word or universe. That is, olamim is the set of words. So here they translate it as universe, set of words, because it is plural. So it has mainly a special significance, as it indicates a place, but its fundamental concept is the unknown. So translated with eternity, again, amounts to an invented translation. And think that, on this invented translation, many discussions have been triggered in the past. 
And so all these discussions, uh, when we, we read them, uh, revise them, study them, we realize that they are meaningless. That's why Paul and I are making these videos simply to say, let's make some substitutions so we avoid unnecessary discussions. Talking, for example, about Psalm 24, where at one point we read, you gates, lift up your heads and be lifted up, you eternal doors, and let the King of glory pass, that is literally the King of Kavod. And in a next video, Paul and I will talk to you about the term Kavod. And here, in this text from the Pontifical Biblical Institute, there is a discussion about what is eternal in this psalm. And there are some scholars who say that what is eternal are the gates themselves. They are eternal since they have been built in the infinitely remote past. Others say, no, we should think of eternal in relation to the future, always referring to the gates. Other scholars say, no, the eternal ear is not referring to the gates, but to Yahweh. So you understand that here a discussion is being held. A discussion is being conducted about nothing, because Olam does not mean eternity. The concept of eternity refers directly to the vision of the universe and its inhabitants mentioned in Psalm 24, which I have mentioned before, to the journeys of the so-called gods in the Bible and of the entire planet itself. I had the opportunity to discuss this topic with Professor Avi Loeb, former director of the Department of Astronomy at Harvard, who believes in the possibility of the existence of a civilization superior to ours. Avilab started the Galileo project precisely with the aim to gather scientific documentation of the existence of such civilizations. Meanwhile, in the journal Scientific American, he discussed some hypotheses about the possible origin of our universe, which he summarized as follows. The universe may have emerged from a fluctuation of the vacuum, or it may be a cyclic phenomenon with repeated periods of contraction and expansion, or it may have emerged from an entropic principle. However, we can also consider string theory. Among the many hypotheses, he highlights one that is truly unusual. He argues that uh, there may exist civilizations at different degrees of evolution that he rates with letters of the alphabet A, B, C, D. Civilizations that may have been involved in the generation of the universe. Love says that our civilization is a low-level technological civilization, classifiable in class C, because we are unable to control the habitability conditions on our planet and preserve them for the day the sun will die. He even says that we could be classed as a D in the scale because we are destroying the environment in which we live. He goes on to say that a B-class civilization, thus superior to ours, could be independent of its host star. An A-class civilization, on the other hand, could recreate the cosmic conditions that gave rise to its own existence, i.e. produce a universe in a laboratory. This consideration, made by a scientist, yields considerable implications from a religious point of view. 
This reminded me in particular of two passages in the Bible that could evoke this scenario. The first example is found in Genesis 2.8, the verse in which the construction of the so-called Gan Eden is mentioned. There it is written that the Elohim named Yahweh planted a garden in Eden Mi Kedem. Mi Kedem is a term that is normally translated in the East. In reality, Mi Kedem literally means from that which comes before, because Mi is the particle that indicates from, indicates the origin, and the Hebrew term Kedem indicates that which comes before. The meaning of the word uh, East, the place from uh, which the sun rises, is derived from these expressions. So it sounds as if the civilization of the Elohim had set up many Gan Eden, one of which is the biblical one based on earlier models. Therefore, the civilization of the Elohim could be a class B or class A, since it was able to go beyond what we know. The other relevant passage in the Bible is exactly Psalm 24, which I have mentioned earlier. And here I would like to add that it was quoted by Monsignor Corrado Balducci, who, from within the Vatican, was also dealing with the question of possible life outside the earth. Monsignor Balducci said that Psalm 24 contains evidence that the Bible contains traces of the existence, besides the inhabitants of the earth, of other inhabitants of the universe, because the first verses say to Yahweh belongs the earth and all that it contains the world and all who dwell therein. Monsignor Balducci stated that here there is a clear distinction between the inhabitants of the earth and the inhabitants of other places in the universe Yahweh seemed to visit. These populations were Olam, that is, not known to men as I explained in the first part of this video. This is very interesting because it points us to the existence of a possible place where the Elohim, these beings belonging to a culture undoubtedly of a higher class compared to ours, lived. This somehow fits well with the hypothesis that Avilub makes. But all this also brings to our mind, for instance, the various themes Paul is interested in relation to the ancient stories about civilizations that have been present on Earth for millennia. I think of the journey of the Egyptian deities to the so-called Dua, which could be the world from which they came and to which they could return. We also think of the journeys of Ra. We can relate it, for example, to the Greek deity Astrea, who descended to Earth, stayed on Earth for a certain amount of time, and then, disgusted with the behavior of men, returned to the heavens. That is, she returned to her home. I am also thinking about the tales in literature from the Far East. The Vedic literature even mentions celestial roots that have been described in the sacred text and within which some locations in the sky have been identified and called doors or gates as in the Psalm 24. Through these gates, the Deva, 
deities of Hinduism uh, well known to Paul would pass. So we are confronted with the stories of the travels of some superior civilizations that come from afar and that, according to Professor Love, could hypothetically have the knowledge to fabricate and visit universes, including the one in which we live. Therefore, a possible new reading of the biblical text done faithfully as Paul and I are trying to suggest, could lead to a new approach to the biblical text that definitely involves the intervention of science in collaboration with theology. So, these discussions cannot be resolved because the monotheistic theological exegists will always say that it means eternity, even though we know that it is a wrong translation. And in order to uh, avoid getting into these spirals, we will do the following. When we find in the Bible the concept of eternity, we avoid the wasting time by simply replacing it with Olam, knowing that in most cases it does not even have a temporal meaning but a meaning related to an unknown place. This is uh, therefore one of the important uh, substitutions to make in order to read the Bible respectfully and understand it uh, better. Now, Paul and I have suggested four terms that can radically change our understanding of the Old Testament. And we will have some very, very interesting ones in the next videos. Thank you, Paul. Bye and see you all next time. Ciao, Mauro. Grazie. Appassionante. Come sempre. Religious belief for generations has variously enticed and tormented believers with prospects of eternity, the threat of eternal damnation for believing or doing the wrong thing, and the promise of eternal reward for doing and believing the right thing. It's the ultimate carrot and stick, or if you like, it's the ultimate good cop, bad cop routine. But as Mauro and I explore the word olam in the ancient Hebrew texts of the Bible, we're coming to the conclusion that some of these beliefs about eternity may be rooted in a concept that is largely absent from the Bible, largely absent from the Hebrew scriptures, and that some of our ideas about eternity may actually be based on some questionable translation. Now, you might say to me, Paul, I'm actually not very interested in theology, or I'm not a religious person, and eternity just isn't something I think about. And that's fair enough. But I'd ask you this, are you interested in the cosmos? Are you interested in the nature of this dimension that we occupy? Are you intrigued by the idea of stargates or wormholes? Would you be interested to know if our ancestors had ideas about or even experiences of interdimensional contact or contact with cosmic neighbors. Now, if any of those things interest you, then I'd suggest that this mysterious word from the ancient texts of the Hebrew Bible is well worth your attention. This little word, olam. If I use the word dimensions, you might think I'm using language that's pretty exclusive to the 20th and 21st centuries, not a concept you'd expect to find in ancient narratives or in the Bible. But I would suggest to you that in ancestral narratives all around the world, the concept of dimensionality is there. The idea of a dimension that is different to ours, somehow occupying the same space, and yet beyond the realm of our knowledge, beyond the realm of our senses, you can find it. 
in the stories of our ancestors. If you think about the Norse stories, there is a dimension which is occupied by beings more advanced than ourselves, whom we usually don't perceive, that we're not aware of, that we might not even know about. And yet what happens in that dimension impacts what happens in this dimension. You can hear it in an ancient Celtic story of the Shea, which was a parallel dimension immediately adjacent to our own that could impact life in this dimension as we perceive it and enjoy it. And the ancient Celts had shamanic protocols, mystical practices designed to enable us to tune in to the realities of the Shea, of the other dimension. And then there are similar stories in Aboriginal Australian culture, which speak about the dreaming or the dream time. And once again, this is not stories of the past or fables to illustrate the present. These are stories about another dimension, another layer to this reality that's beyond the usual realm of our senses, but which still impacts our material life in this dimension. So whether we're on the southern hemisphere or in the northern hemisphere, going into the deep past, our ancestors did have some kind of a way of speaking about what we would call dimensions. And I would suggest that this word olam is a clue that in the Bible itself, similar ideas may have existed. Earlier, Mauro talked about how the Talmud uses the word olam and translates it to mean worlds or universes. But right in the roots, in the etymology of this word olam is the idea of the unknown, the mysterious unknown. And I think we do have language like that in the English language when we talk about the great beyond. It's beyond our senses, it's beyond our knowing, it's out into the cosmos, something we don't know, but that we know is there. And there's that sense of mystery. It's beyond our knowledge. It's beyond the realm of our senses. It's beyond visibility. It's beyond the material. And I would suggest that all those layers are there in the ancient Hebrew usage of the word olam. Now, just as we saw with the word Elohim, olam may have made a journey throughout its history in the Bible. Words can carry different meanings in different contexts and they can change their meaning through time. And we looked at the word chapter in the English language and how that word has changed its meaning through time. So did Olam ever have an association with time, or is it really and truly just a word that means the unknown or the beyond? Well, there are passages where there is a temporal reference in the usage of the word olam. If we go to the book of Isaiah, we can find a couple of examples. In the book of the prophet Isaiah from the 8th century BCE, we read this. I have held my peace, may olam. I have been still and restrained myself. But now, like a woman in labor, I will cry and pant and gasp. What's interesting in that example is that there is a reference to time. I have held my peace, may olam, for a time, but now I will cry out. So it's curious, it refers to time, but not in the sense of infinite time or eternity. No, I'm only gonna hold my peace for so long, and now I'm gonna cry out. So it refers to a period of time that is actually limited. So it means almost the opposite of infinite time in that text, Isaiah 42, 14. And we can find something very similar in Isaiah 32. Because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted, the forts and towers will become lairs for animals, O lamb, a happy place for donkeys, a pasture for flocks, until the Ruach from on high comes down. And so there again is a reference to time, but it's not an infinite time. It's a time until the cities will be deserted 
for a time, for a season, olam, until the ruach comes. So again, it means almost the opposite of infinite time or eternity. It refers to this time that is limited. Now, just as Mauro said, some Hebrew scholars point out that in the root of the word olam is this sense of what has been concealed or hidden or left unknown. And so maybe in these verses, such as from Isaiah 32 and Isaiah 42, where there is a reference to time, it's talking about a time whose length has been concealed, a time that will continue for an unknown period until the mysterious Ruach comes down. The city will be deserted for we don't know how long until the Ruach returns. And so that association of concealment, unknown, beyond the realm of our knowledge or senses is there even in those texts. And that aspect, the beyond, the unknown, the concealed, is really emphasized in a passage that we can read in the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is a very mysterious book with Aramaic words and Persian words scattered through the text. So there's a Mesopotamian connection in this book of Ecclesiastes. And it uses the word olam like this. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put ho olam in their hearts, so that without exception, no one can find out the work that the powerful ones made from beginning to end. That's a wonderful and mysterious passage. He has put something unknown in their heart, so that without exception, no one knows. That's what Ecclesiastes says and how Ecclesiastes uses the word. And there's that tremendous sense of mystery and concealment in that passage. So having seen that, when we go to the word olam in other texts, we might have a bit more of a sense of the various ways we could read these sentences. For instance, in Genesis 21, 33, we read, And he planted in Beersheba a tamarisk tree, and there called on the name of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh here is translated as the eternal God. But as Mauro said earlier, and as we've seen in the earlier episodes, that is not really a translation of the terms. It's a theological reading in. If we use the root meanings of the words, what that text says is this. And he planted in Beersheba a tamarisk tree, and there called on the name of Yahweh, the powerful one, the unknown, or the powerful one, beyond. So let's get back to our questions about dimensions, parallel universe, cosmic contact, so on and so forth. Is Monsignor Corrado Balducci correct? Now, if you don't know, he was a senior theological advisor to Pope Benedict XVI. He is a senior Vatican advisor in the area of paranormal ministry, that's entity removal and exorcisms. Now, about a decade ago, Monsignor Corrado Balducci came out with some very interesting statements about people experiencing close encounters in the present day. And he said that what people are reporting are not psychotic breaks, they're not entity attachments or demonic experiences, they're a totally different kind of entity that merits serious study. And that rather got my attention. He argues that the Hebrew scriptures are full of references to experiences of that kind. Now, is he right? Is the Bible full of references to paleo contact? Now, there's a point in the Bible where these ideas and these questions come together with the word olam in a very interesting way, and it's in Psalm 24. Lift up, you gates, your heads, and be lifted up, you doors, olam. Hmm. Are these doors to the unknown, 
doors that lead to the great beyond? Well, let's see what comes through the doors. And shall come in Melech HaKavod, the king with his glory, the king with his kavod. Now, what is one of those? Is this a text about a portal to another dimension? Is this a text about a wormhole to another region of space? What is this kavod that the king is going to arrive with or that he's associated with? Is Monsignor Corrado Balducci correct in saying that the whole of this psalm points to a populated universe and contact with cosmic neighbors. I wonder if the doors to the unknown in Psalm 24 might bear some relation to the Bab El, the gateway for the powerful ones referenced in the book of Genesis chapter 11, which refers not to some metaphysical experience, but to ancient technology on the Shinar plain in the place that today we call modern Iraq. Is that what this psalm is about? Is Psalm 24 really just an innocent coronation psalm? Or does it point to ancient portal technology, stargate technology, wormhole experiences, and interdimensional contact? But that's for next time. The final edit of the Old Testament of the Bible, the Hebrew canon included the layering of some beautiful and profound theology over the top of ancient texts. Unfortunately, mistranslating traumatic ancestral memories as if they were encounters with God is a choice with far-reaching consequences. Belief in a violent, xenophobic, hierarchical God has been used through the ages to justify violent wars and all manner of abuses. However, the fidelity which the ancient manuscripts have been curated in the Hebrew canon by countless generations of priests and scribes means that in our generation we can now return to these fascinating artifacts of our prehistory and ask how differently they might be translated. To find out more about Paul Wallace and Mauro Bellino, along with links to their published works, follow the links in the video description. Thanks for watching The Fifth Kind. Please subscribe and click the bell icon so you never miss out on new content. For more thought-provoking programs, interviews, and documentaries, check out our website at fifthkind.tv.